Bibles back to Philippians chapter 4 as we continue looking at Paul's letter to the Philippian church on Sunday night. Philippians chapter 4, uh, we'll be breaking into chapter 10 through chapter 2, uh, excuse me, verse 10 through verse 23 this evening. If you would bow with me and let's pray. Father, we just exalt you, we glorify you, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for the opportunity to grow, so much for the opportunity, Lord, to to hear you, to hear you speak. And Lord, we just pray tonight as we open up your word that you would speak to us through your word, dear Lord, that we would see it as you have intended it to be understood, that we will be uh, open to the Holy Spirit to, to just guide us, Father, as we worship you, as we hear from you. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that we will be transformed by your word. All this we pray in your name, amen. Tonight, we are going to talk about giving, and you're thinking, you've got to be kidding me. This has been the worst two-week stretch ever of topics in the church. If you think about it, we've hit some pretty rough topics for the last two weeks. Remember, last Sunday morning was death, and the Sunday night was how to do disunity, and this morning was examination and, and repentance. Tonight, we're talking about giving. I don't know where else we could go from here, to be honest with you. So you might be thinking in your mind, this is like a relentless beating. Why, why, why in the world are we going to talk about giving tonight? So let me give you three reasons why we're going to talk about giving. The most important reason is this. It's the next passage up. you got to understand that when you're preaching through a book of the Bible, you don't get to pick them. You just got to get what comes next. And so it's the next one. And I keep telling you, if you skip something that's uncomfortable, it really looks bad. It's all God's Word. It needs to be talked and addressed. So therefore, it's the next one up. Number two, the reason why we're going to talk about it is because the Bible talks a lot about money. The Bible talks a lot about possessions. The Bible talks about giving and receiving. And therefore, it's just as important to talk about as talking about forgiveness and talking about serving and talking about everything else that we do. If it's a topic in the Bible, it's God's Word and needs to be discussed. Number three, the reason why we're going to talk about it is is that, believe it or not, this is an awesome passage. This passage really deals with Paul's theology on giving and receiving, and it's topics and viewpoints that we normally don't talk about. It really will push our understanding of giving and receiving when it comes to gifts and it comes to finances. Once again, this is a unique passage that has an unbelievable theology that if we actually apply it to our lives, will impact the way we see quite a bit. So with those things lined up, we're not going to approach this with dread when you see the word give big behind me on two screens, you're going to approach this with the idea of joy, knowing that we're going to see what God has to say about this subject. Amen? Are you with me, right? All right. That was, that was pretty enthusiastic. I appreciate that. So, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 23, in this passage, what we see is that Paul, thanks to Philippians for their generous gift, he talks about the idea and of really the theology behind giving and receiving, and then he closes his letter. Do know that in this passage, we can really see six key words that can describe Paul's view of giving and receiving. And I will tell you that because this thing is really so much and really a great thing to enjoy. I don't want to rush through it. So we're actually going to break this down into two parts. So we're going to do some tonight, and then in two weeks we'll come back and finish it. Tonight we're actually going to look at verses 10 through 16. We're going to look at those sections so we don't have to rush, and we'll talk about three of the words that we can use to describe Paul's theology of, of giving and receiving. And then we'll talk about how it applies to us. And then when we come back in two weeks after the hymn fest next week, that sounds so exciting. You very excited? about that next week? that will be great. So in two weeks, we're going to come back, and we'll finish out 17 through 23 together. Just know that this should be taken together. It's just too much to, to want to rush through, though. We're going to slow down and enjoy uh, these uh, closing passages. So right now, you're thinking, awesome, not just one Sunday night, but two Sunday nights on giving. How more can this get? This is awesome. So well, well, there it is, there it is. And so well, we'll, we'll just move forward on that. Do know that as we look at the three words that Paul is going to describe to use, uh, that we use can describe Paul's view on giving and receiving. We're going to talk about that and talk about how it applies to us. And listen, as a Christian tonight, as you hear this passage and hear what Paul is saying, we need to really consider what we think about giving and receiving, and how it really matches up with what Paul is saying, what the Bible has to say how it matches up. 
uh, in, in what God's Word is saying. And tonight, if you're not a Christian, do understand, we just encourage you to listen in and hear. To hear that how a relationship with God through faith in Christ can transform everything in your life, including the way you see giving and receiving. Because that's what Paul is talking about, that through Christ, even this is transformed. Now, as we begin tonight, let me just remind you of things that we talked about several months ago when we began the letter of Philippians, because as we're working through it, it, it makes sense to be able to see how that's flowing together. As we recall, that we know that Paul at this point is under house arrest in Rome. He's awaiting his trial with Caesar, and we know that being under house arrest, he cannot leave. He cannot go. He's under 24-7 watching a, a, of a guard there, but being under house arrest, he actually has to pay for a lot of that stuff to be able to stay there, but he can't leave it actually to make money. Now, he can uh, receive people, he can send people back and forth, but he can't leave himself. So he really needs to be financially supported by those around him. This is something that allows Paul to be able to do what he's doing because he cannot do it himself. And we do know that the Philippian church was people who supported Paul throughout his ministry. We can pretty much pick out several times that they have done it throughout their relationship together. And we know this is one more time that the Philippian church was supporting Paul. From what we read, we understand that they are sending a, a gift, a financial gift to, to Paul through a guy by the name of Paphroditus. And Paphroditus was not only going to deliver the gift, he was going to stay and care for Paul uh, in his needs while he was under house arrest. We don't know exactly when. We don't know it was on the way there or while he was there, but Paphroditus became really sick and almost lost his life. And so when he was well enough, we know Paul is going to send him back to the Philippians. More than likely, he's taking this letter that we call the book of Philippians with him to deliver. And so in writing this letter, there's a couple of things that Paul is wanting to address. Number one is why he's sending the Paphroditus back. They were not expecting to receive him back, and they would have been surprised. And we know Paul addresses this in chapter 2. He explains why he's sending him back, and so they won't be worried or be concerned of why he has returned. We also know one of the major reasons that Paul is writing this letter is to deal with disunity in the Philippian church. This is one of the main reasons why he's sending this letter. This disunity that seems to be centered around two ladies, uh, Euodia and Syntyche, Paul pretty much calls out, as we saw last week in chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. This disunity seems to be something that's breaking them for their main focus, which is to be focused on the gospel. So Paul, even though it comes to a head in chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, Throughout the whole letter, Paul is moving to this really clear discussion of what he's saying is to be united together for the gospel through humility. That's what he, the underlying meaning of the whole letter. He's telling them that you need through humility of putting God's glory before your own, putting the needs of others above yourself, put the gospel first. That's what citizens of heaven do. You live as, as Christ as your king, heaven as your home, and the gospel is your priority. This you need to rally around and make sure that that is your focus. And one of the third reasons that Paul is writing this letter back is he wants to thank them for the financial gift in which they have sent. He, he wants to thank them that they are supporting him. But of course, in, in, in complete Pauline language. He just can't say thank you. He's got to point it all back to Jesus. That's what Paul does. Everything is about Jesus. And so in this point, he's actually pointing them back to what it means to give, what it means to receive in a transformed life through Jesus Christ. For Paul, thank you is not enough. He wants to point him to Jesus. So as we look through, I'm going to show you three words that really characterize tonight in verses 10 through 16, what Paul's Thank you. What Paul is saying that giving and receiving is based on and characterizing it uh, when you've been transformed through Christ. The first word that I think we can see is the word gratitude. That giving and receiving is really based in the sense of gratitude. And this is what comes in verse 10. Listen to what he says. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at, the, at last your care for me has flourished again, though surely did care. But though you surely did care, 
but you lack the opportunity. In verse 10, what we can see really is Paul thanking them for the gift, right? And sometimes we read this and it almost looks like it's like a, a backhanded thank you, almost like it's criticism. It's all like, I am so glad, you know, you're, you're helping me again because, you know what, you didn't for a while there and now you're doing it again. A lot of people look at it that way. It's not what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, I am very excited that you're able to support this again. Help me because now you have the opportunity. What he's saying is the Philippians didn't have the opportunity for a while. We're not sure, we know the Philippians have supported Paul several times. We're not really sure exactly what has broken the opportunity for them to support him in the continual, consistent way they probably were. There's just several factors that we can know. That probably during the last time of their support, Paul has been very hard to get to. Remember, Paul has been in prison. Paul has been shipwrecked. Paul has been in hiding. They've been trying to kill Paul, and now he's been finally locked up in Rome. He's not really been in the place to receive a lot of help. The second thing we also know about the Philippians from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 through 9 is that they have been going through financial problems themselves. They have had drought. They have a, a, a lot of famine going through their, their, their lives, and they have honestly not had the opportunity to give. They're not a wealthy church, and we know this, but we know they've been given graciously of what they do have. And so more than likely, what Paul is saying is, we thank you that you're once again giving us this opportunity or that you have the opportunity, knowing that he's been unavailable and they've been struggling. That's not really the neat thing about this point of gratitude. In this thing that we see Paul's gratitude, we actually says what he's grateful for. He's saying, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. In this, he really never says, I'm thanking you directly. What he's saying is, I am thanking God greatly. I am su super, super grateful to God that he worked in you to help me. He's saying, I am thankful that God gave you the opportunity to help me. I am thankful that God gave you the resources to actually help me. I am thankful that God placed me in your mind so that you would help me. His praise is to God that God used them to help him. The gratitude is directed towards God. Now, you might say, why is that a big deal? Well, in giving gratitude to God and thanking God for using them, Paul has avoided three things that we actually have a problem with when we come to thanking people for helping us. Number one, he's, invo he's avoided manipulation. Because a lot of times when we give and people help or we help people, there's also, often the thing you can sound like manipulation. You go, what does that mean? So if you ever have sent someone help in a missions or a ministry, right? Sometimes they come back with thank you and they begin to tell you how much more need they have, Right? Thank you for giving us X, but we have so much more need. You know, if God moves you to give more. It, listen, I'm not saying they're trying to manipulate you, but it comes across like that very often, right? Sometimes when we're trying to help people or say thank you, well, we're always talking about the continual need that has. Paul doesn't do that. Paul says, listen, I'm so grateful to God because God gave you what I needed. There is no form of manipulation in the thank you. Number two, what Paul avoids in his thank you is that he doesn't do over flattery. He doesn't say, because you have given me money, I'm going to put your name on this plaque that I have in house arrest as one of my gold givers. Now, if you're a platinum giver, I could put your name on the letter and say you gave so much. He is not thanking them like they have done something. He is recognizing that the only way they have the ability to give is because God has blessed them in order to give. So there's no flattery in the person. The gratefulness goes to God for the ability and for the opportunity for them to do that. Here's the third thing he, he avoids is silence. Sometimes we have a hard time thanking people because it's awkward. We don't know what to say. And sometimes we want to avoid that. But what Paul shows us is the best way to say thank you is to just say thank God for you. 
You need to say it. You need to make the recognition that God actually worked in them and through them. So in this really simple statement, when, God, when Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord, I rejoice greatly in what he's done, Paul has given us a great form of thank you. He's been able to tell us this is number one, you need to do it. You, you need to do it either through letter or do it through face. Uh, number two, you need to make sure that, that you give the flattery to God because God is the one who has given. God is the one who has provided. You need to make sure that his name is great. And in that, you never look like you're asking for more money. And you would say, why would I go through all that trouble? Why can't I just say thank you? Because in this simple way of doing it, what Paul has reminded us, that it's never about us. It's always about God. Now, we reveal that in our actions and our attitudes. That when we give and receive thanks, we often forget that the only reason we have the opportunity to give and receive is because he has given us the opportunity to give and receive. If we truly believe it is all by God, for God, and through God, then that can even come out in our thank you. So understand that Paul says that in the idea of giving and receiving, there should be gratitude, but we need to thank God for what the person has been able to do. Because he's the one who gives, he's the one who provides, and he's the one who leads them to do it. The second word that we can see in Paul's theology of giving and receiving is the word contentment. Is the word contentment. Listen, this is a big deal in this portion of the passage, and we see how Paul connects it. Look what it says in verses 11 through 13. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and, and I know how to abound. Everywhere, everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's really neat that Paul starts off right after he has shown gratitude. He, he saying, listen, I'm so glad you have sent me this. I can tell you I definitely need this. But he says, I also want you to know that where my source of joy, where my source of fulfillment, where, where my source and resource comes from, and he says that's through Christ. He's not saying that he's not thankful for the gift. He's already thanked God for it and what he's done. But what he is saying is this. He's saying, but you know what? I would be content no matter what. That my contentment is not based on whether I got the gift or not. My contentment is based on Jesus. And see, when we talk about the term contentment, when we talk about the term kind of like to be at peace with ourselves, a lot of times the way we define that is self-sufficient. We're content because we can make do with what we have. We're self-sufficient with what we have. For Paul, contentment is not self-sufficient, it's Christ-sufficient. He's saying that I can be content, I can be at peace because Christ is enough. He is enough in any and all situations. He is enough in anything that's going on. Paul's not saying that I am self-sufficient in all things. He's saying Christ is enough in all things. And that's totally different. And in these three verses, Paul gives us three truths about contentment that I think we can grab a hold of. Three truths about contentment. Number one is this, contentment is not based on your circumstances. Contentment is not based on your circumstances. This is one thing that Paul puts out very clearly. He, he says over and over again, it, it doesn't matter if I have enough or if I have little. It doesn't matter if my situation is great or my situation is bad. He's saying, I am content because I believe Christ is enough. It's not about the situation. It's not about the possession. It's not about our comfort. It's about having him. And so, Christian, this is often a hard question that we need to ask. When you're thinking about being at peace, when you're thinking about being in contentment, do you often think about what else you need to have or what you don't need to have. Some people, it's for me to be content, I need to have a better job. For me to be content, I need to have a better house. For me to be content, I need to have separation from my children or something like that, whatever that is. It's not me, I'm talking, I'm talking about you. For other people, 
It may be, you know what, I need to be content. If I'm going to be content, I'm going to sell everything and I'm going to live off the grid. Have you ever heard that? If I'm going to be content, i got to give it all up and get away from everything. This is the hard, sobering thing that Paul says. Contentment is not based on your situation. It's not based on what you have or what you don't have. Contentment is never based on your circumstances. It's only based on Jesus. The second truth that Paul tells us about contentment is that contentment is learned. That contentment is learned. How many times does Paul say in this passage, for I have learned, for I have learned, for I know? We have the understanding that contentment is not something that's zapped into us when we become a believer. He's saying that I have learned this in the difficult situations. I have learned this in the good situations. That over time, over event, I have learned that no matter what I'm facing, Christ is the thing that is enough. Paul is saying, listen, in the situation that it was good, I was tempted to be comfortable. I was tempted to be settled. I was tempted to take my focus off Jesus Christ, which brings true joy. In the difficult times, Paul says, I was tempted to take my eyes off of Christ and to put them on my problems, therefore not receiving true joy of being focused on him. Paul says, what I've learned that in the bad and what I've learned in the good, what I've learned in the hard and what I've learned in the easy, that the bottom line is it's about Jesus. That no matter what I'm facing, contentment only comes through Jesus. The third truth that we see Paul say is that contentment only comes when we're in fellowship with Christ. Contentment only comes when we're in fellowship with Christ. And that's actually what he's saying in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is probably the most quoted passage out of Philippians. It's on t-shirts. It's on bumper stickers. It's on your daily devotional. It is probably the most quoted, and it's probably the most understood. It's probably the one that we miss what it's actually saying the most. This is not a categorical statement. This is not a, a, a statement that applies to every area of your life. Paul is not saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, therefore I can break out a house prison and, and I can body slam my guard and run with 4-4 speed and go beat with you guys in Philippians. I, I'm going to tell you flat out, we, we talk about March Madness and the NCAA basketball tournament. There is something that I've become acutely aware of uh, in the last several weeks no matter what, no matter how much I quote Philippians 4.13, no matter how much faith I have, there's no way I can legitimately slam dunk a basketball. It ain't about faith. It's about athleticism and height and ability, skill. I mean, there's a long list. It's not, it, what Paul is saying here, he is not saying that you can do whatever you want to through faith in Christ. It's not, what, it's not what he's saying. This verse has to be taken in context with what Paul is saying. And in the context of what Paul is saying is, he's saying that I can be content in any situation that I am placed because Christ empowers me to do it. That's the context of the passage that I can be content in bad and good, in hard and easy. I can be content in all of that because it's Christ who empowers me to do it. It's not, listen, I'll tell you flat out, you cannot go out tonight and bench press the Volkswagen because you think you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things that Christ empowers you to do, that he chooses to do, and in the context of this verse, is to be content in all situations. I like the way that commentator Peter O'Brien puts it. He says this, Paul is saying that through Christ, he's able to be content in every situation. This is the secret. Christ is enough. Christ empowers us to be content. Paul learned the secret because he learned to give attention to the Savior. Paul isn't preoccupied with his situation He's preoccupied with Jesus. This is the secret. When you focus on Jesus, you become 
content. So what is Paul saying in these verses? He's saying this. He's saying, listen, Philippians, I thank you for the gift that you've given me, but even if I didn't receive it, I was going to be okay because, honestly, I'm content in Jesus. I've learned throughout my ministry, I've learned through no matter what I'm going through, good times or bad times, it's when Jesus is my focus that I know peace and I know contentment. It's through Jesus' empowerment that I can be content no matter what. And so, Christian, the question tonight is, are you content? Are you at peace? Because if you're not, there's a strong possibility you're focusing more on your circumstances, more on your possessions, more on your positions, more on your situation than you are on Jesus. Because through Jesus, you be content in any situation. Now, most of you know the name Jeff Gordon, right? NASCAR legend. Just me? Am I the only one? I figure I'm in NASCAR country, right? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. I got one or two. All right. Jeff Gordon said this. I don't remember this. I have to read it. He said this. Either you focus or you end up hitting something really hard. Now, he's talking about NASCAR racing, but I like this. Either you focus or you end up hitting something really hard. I think this really describes the Christian life. Either you focus on Jesus or you're going to really hit really hard disappointment, disillusionment, discontentment, and depression. If you don't focus, you won't be content. And that's what Paul says about giving and receiving. That's not about the gift. Thankful for it. But true contentment, true peace, Jesus empowers me to have that. And that's what I focus on. Third truth, or really the third word that we can see here uh, in our section tonight is the word partnership. It's the word partnership. Look at what he says in verses 14 through 16. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Paul talks about the Philippians sharing in his ministry. He calls them partners. He calls them co-laborers in other parts of this letter. He says in the fact that you have really supported me financially, you are sharing in my distress. You are sharing in my ministry. Even though we're hundreds of miles apart because you're financially supporting me, being a part of this, you are a part of my ministry here in Rome. Listen, we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 that the Philippians, they were not a wealthy church. This area, the Macedonia, was going through some really difficult times uh, uh, with famine and with drought. But we also know that the Philippians were known for their generosity. They were known for their sacrificial giving. They were known for giving to help for the advancement of the gospel. And this is what Paul is saying. You as a church partnered with me for the advancement of the gospel like no other people have, like no other church had. Even from the very beginning when you were a young congregation, this was important to you. Paul calls them partners. He's saying you shared when you were giving to me and therefore I take the gift in seeing you as a partner for what I'm doing here. Listen, I'll tell you, I think it's very important for churches to see the, the Philippians' mindset when it comes to giving to support and helping others who are advancing the gospel, church planners, missions, missionaries. And listen, I, I'll have to tell you, this is the one thing, one of the major things that really excites me about Trinity. I mean, from its very inception, this church has made the decision that we are going to partner with agencies, with missions, with missionaries for the gospel, that we're going to support them and be a part of the missions that they're doing, whether it's local and whether it's national or whether it's international. I think it's awesome what our church does, and we've talked about it, but I'll continue to talk about it. 
As you know, the church from its inception made the decision that 23% of everything that comes in on, on Sundays and comes in as a tithe goes to support missions and missionaries and church plants that are being done locally and nationally, internationally. That means 23 cents out of every dollar that's given in the offering plate is given to other agencies, to other missionaries, to other ministries for the gospel. In the breakdown, you can see 17% goes to the cooperative program, which is the group giving plan for the Southern Baptists. And it supports a ton of ministries, from the North Carolina Children's Baptist Home to, to international ministries, to, to the North American Mission Board, uh, to the, um, helping out with um, uh, um, uh, evangelism and church plants in North Carolina to, to supporting the six Southern Baptist seminaries to Fruitland Bible Institute. The list goes on and on with that 17%. It's a huge uh, opportunity to support so many ministries. Past that, 3% of everything that's given goes to support the South Yakin Baptist Association, which does so much in local ministries and partnering this area. You know them through the toy store. You know them through, through, uh, through the fair ministry, through the clothes closet. 2% goes to support the missions that we do here as a church, local, national, international missions. 1% goes to benevolence to support those families in our church and outside of our church in need. To me, that's awesome. That 23% of everything that's given goes to support to advance the gospel, and the church operates on the remaining 77%. It's rare, and I think it really matches up with what Paul is talking about. Even more than that, we even do special offerings. That's in addition to the 23%. You gave to the International Mission Board through Lottie Moon Christmas offering that supports international missions. Next week, we'll start talking about the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, which supports North American missionaries and church plants. We've given to the Lake Norman Pregnancy Center. We, we collect for the Operation uh, Christmas Child. Uh, we, we do uh, North Carolina uh, Baptist Ministries, which helps disaster relief. I mean, there's so much extra offerings we do as well. To me, it's very exciting that this is a giving church and that sees the importance of partnering with people who are advancing the gospel locally, nationally, and internationally. Because honestly, this is what we see Paul talking about. He looks at the Philippians and he says, we thank you for your generosity. He goes, I, I thank you for your sacrifice that you have continually supported. You have continually done this from the very beginning and you are partners in the gospel. And I do believe that we as a church continue to give. We need to see ourselves partnering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not giving money. We're supporting the name of Christ being spent out locally, nationally, and internationally. And my prayer is that we will continue to do it and continue to see it as an act of worship. So as we come and we look at this passage and we see Paul's really amazing, I think, theology in giving and receiving, as we look at this text and we try to figure out what we're supposed to do from it, I think we need to really listen to some of the things in what he says and we're trying to respond to it. We need to really think about what he is putting into play on his theology, what he's talking about, what it means to give and receive. Paul came tonight and he starts off, he's saying, listen, we need to be grateful to God. The praise needs to go to God. He's the one who empowers. He's the one who, who, who leads. He's the one who gives the opportunity. He should be the focus of the gratitude that we give. But even in the giving and receiving of gifts, we need to be content. And understanding that contentment comes through Christ alone. And he will give us the contentment. He will empower us to be content no matter the situation. He still needs to be our focus. And then Paul says we also need to be thankful for the partnerships. Because everything that is given needs to be given with the idea that we're partnering for the gospel and received with the understanding that we're co-laborings to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with all that in mind, the question is how should we, we respond? And I would say, allow our giving and receiving to be transformed by Christ. Allow us to see it the way that Paul is describing it. So what does that mean to each of us? 
Well, first night, if you're not a Christian, I do understand that you really can't see giving and receiving like this because you first have to be transformed through Jesus Christ. And the only way you can be transformed through Jesus Christ is to come to him in faith, asking for forgiveness and rescue and reconciliation with God. That's where it begins. These things only happen through his power, through the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. So tonight where you start is you come to God through faith in Christ. In a few moments, we'll have the invitation. I will tell you that that is what God is crying out to you through the Holy Spirit. He's making you aware of your separation from God because of your rebellion against him and your choosing to be your own God. But he's also making you aware of his offer, his desire for you to come to him through faith in Christ. I encourage you just to say yes. And you might say, how am I getting from a, 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 a passage about giving to a passage to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior? The bottom line is it all begins with Jesus and it ends with Jesus and Jesus is in the middle. That's where it always is about. So that's where it begins for you tonight. During the invitation, if the Holy Spirit is making it very clear to you, I invite you to come down. Pastor and Michael and I will be down here. We'd love to tell you more about Christ. We'd enjoy it. Christian, what about you? Well, let me ask you a question. How would your life change? How would your giving and receiving changed if you actually saw it the way that Paul saw it? How would it change if you saw every gift as coming from God alone? That God only empowered the person. That God only gave them the resources. That God basically gave them the opportunity to give it to you because he was working through them. How would it change your idea of receiving a gift of knowing that it came through God and his working and his empowerment? How would your contentment be? How would your status in life be right now if you realize that it only comes through focusing on Christ? That no matter what you're facing right now, no matter what problem you're going through, no matter what difficulty it is, no matter how good you have it right now, how would it change if you understood that it doesn't matter what you get, it doesn't matter what you give, it doesn't matter what position you're in, you don't matter how hard it is or how comfortable it is, you're not going to be content unless you're focused on Jesus. How would it change your outlook right now? And how would it change your giving and receiving if you're understanding that everything you give to this church, everything you give as an offering is a partnership for the gospel. You're not giving it because you have to. You're not giving it out of duty. You're not giving it because you believe God's going to give you more in return. You're actually going to give it as an act of worship, partnering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. How would it change your outlook on giving and receiving? So as we come to the invitation tonight, I would just encourage you, Christian, just to pray and say, Holy Spirit, where is it that I, I need to uh, adapt this view? Where is it that I need to have this in my life? And wherever he leads you, just say yes, and he'll take care of it. Because where God is leading you, he is able to take you. You just have to be willing. If you have any questions or concern, Pastor and Michael and I will be down here. We'll be glad to talk with you. As I've said before on a Sunday night, we'll go to them, right? Do they want us to go to them? Yeah. You raise your hand. We'll come. We'll walk to you too. We're, we're, we're that open tonight. But just respond to whatever he's telling you to do. Don't allow geography from there to here to keep you from growing closer to him. No matter who you are this evening, I encourage you to seek the Holy Spirit. And may everything that we do be an act of worship, including giving and receiving. May it always be about him. Father, we praise you, we glorify you, we thank you, Lord, for the depth of your love, the depth, Father, that you call us to live and to serve and walk with you and have find joy in all things, Lord, including giving and receiving. We thank you for the joy that we have, Lord, to actually be able to come together and be able to understand that in you there is deeper purpose, there is deeper meaning for your glory in all things that we do. Lord, please, we pray tonight, give us your vision, give us your direction, and allow Allow us to see everything, including giving and receiving, through your eyes. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.